So, at long last, after nine years, we got that long-awaited sequel to Inside Out, with the release of Pixar's Inside Out 2. God. It really has been a long time since I've been so massively hyped up for a Pixar release. I just haven't been feeling them quite so much so recently. I enjoyed Elemental a lot, but I wasn't all that hyped coming into it. The film brought back that nostalgic vibe of being excited to see what they've cooked up that I think they've been missing for the last little while, but yeah, I went to see the film the other day, and whilst I don't think I enjoyed it quite as much as I did the first one, I still really liked it. That being said, I think I have minimal interest in watching it again. And it's not because I thought it was bad, it's because I thought it was too good, too accurate for the early teenage experience, to the point that my inner emotions, they were going nuts, especially my embarrassment. Ugh, I was having a crisis watching all of this. <laughs> Too close to home. But yeah, the film was a banger and the world agrees, and it's doing damn well for itself. For starters, box office, I don't have the actual numbers on hand, but a quick glimpse on social media and all that sort of thing would suggest it's looking to be the biggest opening weekend for any film so far this year, and it's probably going to be a massive financial success. Pixar needed this. It's the power of the long-awaited sequel, and it's why they and Disney and DreamWorks even, they've gone back to the well of their hit franchises. They work and they make the studio money. And that's good for the time being. I hope they can eventually make fresh content too that does just as well, but for now, we're in the era of sequels again. And it's looking to be doing some monster numbers. Maybe it can push to a billion, maybe, we'll see. But it is a Golden Goose franchise now, and one that you can seemingly repurpose again and again whenever you need to. Then in terms of its critical success, the film is doing very well for itself. In terms of its critical score, it's on 92% approval rating on Rotten Tomatoes and an audience approval of 95%. Not too shabby if you ask me. The first one has a 98% critical score and an 89% audience score. But of course, the difference in the audience score, you can probably attribute that to the fact that the first one has over 100,000 reviews. The second, about 500 so far. So the dust has not settled just yet. And I suspect it will drop under that original number eventually. But we'll have to wait and see. But yeah, Inside Out 2 has been a hit so far and is making some definite waves. And it's well deserved. Like I said, this movie is great. And so let's jump into it, shall we? When we're looking at an animated film, I always say you're largely dealing with the holy trinity of animation. Visuals, story, and sound. Everything about them can be slotted into one of those three categories. So visuals, does it even need to be said? This is Pixar. Even when a film is maybe not the best in terms of story or whatever, Pixar films are universally well animated. And they have been since the beginning when they paved the way for a new era of animation, with Toy Story to start with, but then stuff like Finding Nemo really lifted it to a new level altogether. And ever since then, they've been the pinnacle, the measuring stick, the bar that everybody's trying to reach. Lightyear, wasn't a fan of that movie, but my God, was it beautiful. And it's not changed in the least for this film. On top of that, it's just the design of everything. The new characters, the different areas of Riley's mind they visit. It's so wondrous and fantastical. A visual feast. Truly, I especially loved how they managed to continue to nail the various different designs of the different emotions. To the point that, even with a somewhat neutral expression, without hearing any dialogue, I think it's rather easy to pinpoint which character's which. Which emotion they're supposed to represent within the ecosystem of Riley's mind. Down to the clothes that they wear. It's just excellent. Then we come to the audio side of things. Just, yeah, the music, loved it. When that main theme hits right at the start, oh, hell yeah, we were back. Nostalgia was tingling. I had all the feels. The score was very beautiful, very heart-wrenching at times. And I thought the voice acting, my God, the voice acting was phenomenal here. We have the three returning emotions, joy, sadness, anger. Sadness and anger, largely played for comedy this time around, but they just, they work so well. Really great stuff, top-tier performances. Joy, showing off so much range. Of course, there's her happy-go-lucky demeanor, but you get to work with her being sad and also angry, resentful, grumpy. Things you wouldn't expect of her. But they're crucial parts of her growth as she learns about herself and about Riley. On top of that, the recast of Fear and Disgust worked really well, and you could not tell within the first couple of lines. I'd forgotten they used to sound different in the first place. And then there's the new emotions, anxiety, envy, ennui, embarrassment. Nostalgia as well, just, ah, the voices in tandem with their designs, just well and truly encapsulated everything about them. Anxiety in particular, a standout performance for me, with a lot of range as to the type of anxiety being expressed. Angry, sad, terrified, a huge range being shown off there. Honestly, I think anxiety was probably my favorite character in terms of just range of performance. But then the film also just had so many top tier bit parts that were so accurately voiced. The Blue's Clues ripoff character complete with talking sidekick with goofy voices or the video game character who's animated like he appears in a crappy cutscene from the mid to late 2000s. 
and who talks like one too, like a, a badly dubbed game from Japan where the voice actors really just giving the hammiest performance ever. That was undeniable proof that we totally owned you, lamers. I loved it. Very nostalgic. And really, for me, nostalgia is a big part of this film's framework, as, well, I'm obviously not a 13-year-old anymore. And it's also rather ironic, since the emotion nostalgia keeps trying to gate crash every so often, only get told to leave as Riley's not ready for her yet. And so, a lot of the situations that appear during the course of the movie, I've lived through that shit. And it's probably why, despite loving the film, I have minimal desire to watch it through a second time. I have no desire to live through the cringe of my own teen years. Don't make me reflect on that. Don't force me to reflect on that. No, thank you. Going to a new school, feeling overwhelmed and scared, feeling like you've been left behind as your friends pull away and move on with their lives in different directions, like you need to blaze your own trail, feeling like you want to fit in with the popular crowd, changing up who you are to do so, making up dumb little lies for no reason other than your own superficial sense of embarrassment. Oh, I've been there. Lying for literally no reason. My brother and I used to both do this all the time. Stuff like, oh, have you seen Insert Movie Here? And we say, oh, yeah, 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 totally. Even though we haven't, it's just reflex. And then you've dug yourself the hole and you have to commit to the lie. And it gets more and more complicated as you try to unravel what this movie's about from the context clues they're giving you as they talk about it. Oh, it's nightmarish. Why did I used to do that? <laughs> oh, traumatic. But yeah, that's Riley's journey. And I think for pretty much anybody who's gone through or is going through puberty, it should feel quite relatable and endearing. Even if the specifics don't line up, you can still get the emotions behind it. And when you watch the movie, it gives you that sense of, thank God I am not alone in having gone through all this terrible shit. The film gives off this aura of camaraderie for people that are older than perhaps the usual Pixar fare. Because for younger audiences, you know, people going through this maybe would find it even more relatable. And then people younger than this, they just like the funny colors and the laughing and the jokes. That's what they're here for. And that's all just the surface level. That's Riley's own personal story. It doesn't take into account the actual emotions side of things or anything like that. And we'll have a look at that now because they're a core part of the story too. They tell a story that runs parallel to a lot of the drama in Riley's life and informs a lot of it as well. But it's also a bit different and I don't really want to go too much into the overall storyline for the emotions because whilst this is a spoiler review, I don't want to just walk through the whole thing. You need to experience this movie, trust me. But it's a really fun and heartwarming and charming tale. It follows the emotions through the advent of Riley's puberty, where new emotions, anxiety, ennui, embarrassment, envy, emotions you start to feel more deeply throughout your teenage years and beyond come to the control center and it doesn't go very well as is that clash, old versus new. The new emotions think they're the ones that are gonna be able to guide Riley through puberty. So in real speak, the hormones are talking, they're taking control, and this causes the suppression of the OG emotions, and thus begins the quest to find their way back to headquarters and restore Riley's original sense of self. The sense of self that says, universally, I'm a good person. And all the while, anxiety takes charge. And credit where credit's due, she does try her best to set the stage for Riley's future and make her life as easy and happy as possible. But unfortunately, because she is anxiety and she dominates and that's what dominates the new sense of self, she creates one that is completely warped by anxiety, that says, I'm not good enough. And so, this starts to impact Riley's life significantly and causes a massive panic attack. And so Joy and the others have to make their way through Riley's mind and eventually to the control center again, where they're able to avert Riley's panic attack whilst also realizing that both senses of self were no good. Joy's version is almost like denial and it ignores the parts of Riley that they're embarrassed or ashamed of the negative parts, whereas Anxiety's version is overly negative, ignoring the good parts. And so the realization's made that a person's gonna have good days and bad days, but neither should define them. And it's the sum of those days that makes the person who they are, and how they react to it that matters most, which I found deeply wholesome, and deeply relatable, and brought back that poignant beauty that the first one had in spades. It was just a home run, a home run. But I still think I prefer the first one. But this is still an instant classic for me. And so, yeah, not really much else to say other than that, so I think I'll leave it here. And these have just been my opinions, and now I'd like to hear yours. What did you think of the film if you've seen it? Did you like it? Hate it? If you haven't seen it, are you gonna? Are you excited for it? I'm curious for your thoughts, so make sure to like, comment, and subscribe, and let me know.